legacy. How would you define it? Better yet, how will it define you? Legacy isn't just built in an arena. It doesn't just come from trophies or fame. It's a story of change, and it's written every day. It isn't about leaving millions behind but opening a million doors. It's fighting for what you're passionate about and being the change you want to see. It's giving back to your community and making an impact on future generations. Legacy isn't something that's given, but it is something we can start building together. Thank you everyone for tuning in from wherever you are. My name is Shirley Leung and I'm a columnist with the Boston Globe. This is the UBS Leadership Lunch Series. We are marking Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month with a special conversation about Asian Americans and sports. We're gonna be hearing from former NFL player and coach Eugene Chung, two-time Olympic medalist, Alex Shibutani, and ESPN studio anchor and national reporter, Michelle Steele. They will talk about the challenges of being an Asian American in a field in which they're not readily accepted and what it takes to elevate Asian Americans in the world of sports. This topic of Asian American invisibility is a personal one. I am a first generation Chinese American. Um, over the past year, I've seen the rise of anti-Asian hate and life, but life changed for me after the mass shooting in Atlanta um, that took eight lives, including six Asian American women. For the first time in my life, I live with fear for myself, for my children, for my elderly mother and my Asian friends. Um, it's not a paralyzing fear, but one that I recognize that no other American should live with. And that's why it's important to have discussions like this, to show up, to learn, and ultimately speak up and act. And that's the only way we can change the dynamics of race in this country. Um, but before we dive in, we're going to hear from uh, some remarks from our sponsor, UBS, and someone um, from someone who also knows a lot about sports. That's Wale Ogunlea. Um, he's a former Pro Bowl defensive end with the Chicago Bears, who now leads the UBS Global Wealth Management Athletes and Entertain Entertainers Unit. Um, hi, Wale. <laughs> anyway, hey, Wale's going to give us some opening remarks. Thank you so much, Shirley. Good afternoon, and on behalf of UBS Global Wealth Management, I'd like to thank you for joining us today and hope you and your loved ones are safe and healthy. My name is Wale Ogunlea, and I am the head of the Athletes and Entertainers segment at UBS, where I actively work with UBS financial advisors and our athletes and entertainment clients, clients to help them make the right decisions for their careers and legacy. I'd like to thank today's speakers, Eugene Chung, Alex Shibutuni and Michelle Steele. I know I messed up your name, Alex, but forgive me. And finally, I'd like to thank the Globe for the continued work and dedication to the city and the Commonwealth and our continued partnership over the last several months. I found each program packed with insights, tangible takeaways, and I know today's discussion will be an important one. As a former athlete, I'm extremely pleased to be introducing today's discussion. And UBS's purpose is to connect people for a better world in collaboration with the globe, We are bringing together, together Asian American athletes who are using their voices to denounce racism, the wave of anti-Asian settlement and violence in the United States. Sadly, we begin Asian Pacific American Heritage Month at a time when targeted violence against members of the Asian American and Pacific Islander or AAPI community continue to rise. The danger and fear surrounding AAPI homes and neighborhoods 
meant that what should have been an occasion for celebration has also become a time for introspection and action to ensure that this is a safe, inclusive, and welcoming nation for all. I am proud to work at UBS, where our stance is unequivocal. We do not tolerate racism of any kind. We are actively working with many community organizations to explore how we might devote resources and energy to protect and strengthen our AAPI communities. Earlier this month, UBS announced that it will become a founding corporate partner of the Asian American Foundation, an organization led by a powerful board of influential AAPI leaders who have committed $125 million over five years to advance AAPI community and causes. Devoting resources is a critical way that we can help elevate and build bridges between communities. And I'm proud that we're supporting this exciting effort, which complements UBS's overall diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts. Today, I'm looking forward to a spirited discussion where speakers will discuss racism encountered in the sports world, allyship, invisibility, and the need for representation that breaks stereotypes of all kinds, all topics which resonate with me. Once again, thank you so much for joining us today. We hope to continue to share in a dialogue throughout the remainder of the series. Shirley, I'll pass it back to you. Thank you, Wale, and thank you for your allyship and thank you for UBS's allyship. Um, that is so great that you are a founding member of the Asian American Foundation and your organization. So um, we will see Wale later. So uh, we're gonna start our conversation. Um, anyways, uh, uh, so we've received some great pre-submitted questions. And if anyone in the audience uh, wants to ask a live question during the conversation, please use your Q&A function during the Zoom. The chat function has been turned off. So first up is gonna be Eugene Chung. Uh, Eugene, if you could turn on your camera, that would be great. And he is joining uh, us from Fort Myers. Hi, Eugene. Hi, how are you? <laughs> Hello. So Eugene was a first round um, draft pick for the New England Patriots, a member of the Virginia Tech Sports Hall of Fame, and one of the few Asian American coaches in the NFL. Uh, he served as his assistant offensive line coach for the Kansas City Chiefs and later for the Philadelphia uh, Eagles where they beat when they beat the Patriots to win the 2017 Super Bowl obviously Gene we New Englanders we New Englanders are not holding that against you um, because you're here today with us so uh, thank you for being here <laughs> oh thank you thank you for having me so, um, so you want to be the first Asian American head coach of an NFL team. Can you talk about the challenges you faced so far to get there? Yeah, that, that when I first got back into coaching with the NFL, in the NFL, uh, with Philadelphia Eagles, that's always been the, the end goal. You know, it's you know, become a position coach, kind of work through the ranks and then become a head coach um, would be the ultimate goal. Um, I mean, the challenge is it's just the, the opportunity. It, it's such a small window. It's uh, to work number one in the NFL is a, is a gift. It, it's a, it's some, it's special. It's just, they just don't hand those jobs out. So it's a privilege to be able to do that. So the, the, the challenges I've found, I mean, so far is just, you know, being in the, kind of the right place, the right time, being on the right, the right winning team, and just the opportunity to kind of showcase your talents, not just as a coach, but as a, as a manager also, because that's what the head coaches do. It's, it's so much more than just the, the game alone, but the managerial side of it also. So the challenges there are just the opportunities. And with all the um, suggestions of, 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 of what's going on and the temperature of, of the league right now with the Rooney rule, uh, um, and what that's supposed to mean and what that's supposed to be. So it, I find it challenging just to one, just being the, being the, get the right opportunity and luck. And, you know, I tell everyone luck is when preparation meets opportunity. Um, you know, we went, went ahead and won the Super Bowl in uh, the 2017, 2018 Super Bowl, being the Patriots, my former team. <laughs> so, but, you know, you figure there that's, you know, you've reached the highest goal as a coach and as a, as a player. 
you know, you figure that that preparation is, is has been put in and you're just waiting for the opportunity. And sometimes that opportunity won't ever present itself. You just keep working hard and, and hopefully, have, you know, you're in the right place at the right time to get that opportunity. Eugene, can you share a story with us about an interview that happened this year for a coaching job and, and what happened during that interview? Yeah, it, it was a, uh, it, it was a pretty shocking, uh, uh, sh- uh, shocking interview, uh, the way it ended. So, you know, I'm selling myself being the salesman, just going through my, you know, accolades and my experience and what I can bring to this coaching staff. And, and, you know, at my last little comment, it was like, look, you check off all these boxes when you hire me. And one of them being, you know, I'm a minority. So you're hiring, you know, you're hiring a minority on top of that. And they're like, well, you know, and yeah, it was said to me, he's like, well, you're really not a minority. And I just, I, I froze in my tracks going, wait, did I hear that correctly? I was like, I'm, I'm not a minority. I'm so, you know, I kind of looked, I was like, wait a minute, last time I checked, when I looked in the mirror, when I brushed my teeth, I was a minority, you know? So I was like, what do you mean? I'm not a minority. And they're like, well, you're not the right minority we're looking for. And that, and then that's when I just became emotionally paralyzed. Like, am I hearing what I'm hearing right now? And I was like, you want to elaborate on that? I mean, I, I was like, I thought diversity meant all minorities or everybody included. So you know, when that kind of narrative was put out there, I, I finally understood and grasped what the narrative was. It, it was very shocking to me and very heartbreaking at the same time, because it's it's such a it's a, a sport I hold near and dear to my heart. And to hear that that narrative that I don't fit into that narrative, really, it, it was emotionally paralyzing. I just... I stopped in my tracks and was just going through my, you know, my, my thoughts in my head, trying to say the right thing in my, in my next comment. So the, the interview, I mean, ended and it, it didn't end well, but um, it, it just put into perspective of what's really going on. And it's, you know, I, I'm Asian, I'm a minority, but I'm an invisible minority. I'm the model minority, I'm sure, we, which we've heard so many times. And that's the way I felt leaving that. And it just, uh, it really, and that's why I'm here today you know, is because of a comment like that, you know, and, and, and the directive and the, uh, that's out there right, right now, it's, you know, it, it was like, okay, it's time for me to kind of raise my voice and, and, and put out there what I'm experiencing. Eugene, I'm, I'm so grateful for you sharing that story because I think it's important mm-hmm. for everyone to, to hear it. Um, I think too often, you know, people don't understand how invisible Asian Americans are. And, and that story crystallizes it. I remember when you first told me that story, I said, wait, did this happen in 2021? And indeed it did. Yeah. Um, but, but I want to switch gears a little bit here because you also have talked about um, Andy Reid, mm-hmm. the head coach for the Kansas City Chiefs, and how he's been an ally and a mentor in your coaching career. So how has he showed up for you and how has that made an impact? Oh, I mean, he's been such an advocate for me and he's always ensured, he's always told me, he's like, look, it doesn't matter your your color, your skin, your race, your creed, your religion. He's like, that. you put in the hard work, good things will always happen. And I mean, there's times I've had to, you know, consult with him and say, coach, I really need to talk to you. And he's always picked up the phone. He's always called me back or he's always messaged me back and and then that's where he's been such a, a, a mentor to me, for me, and, and, a, and an ally. And he's always encouraged me. He's like, no, don't let the color of your skin or, you know, what you eat, you know, because we always keep it light between us. And, and that's why he's been such a pivotal part of my coaching career. Don't, don't think any less of yourself. Don't think any more of yourself. Don't think any less of yourself. And don't expect anything. He's like, you know, don't expect an undeserving gift. You put the work in and the hard work will show. And the cream always rises to the top. And that's how he's always been there for me. He's all, he's, you know, I almost want to say he's been like a father figure also um, in that sense. Um, a, a person I can always rely on, a person I, I can always go to if I need, you know, if I need answer questions that need to be answered. And he's always, he's always given me great great advice when it comes to that and you know and he's also embraced you know the kind of the asian culture because he's always you know he hasn't you know he grew up in in la and grew up around asians but he didn't 
know the intricacies of everything. I, mean, I remember the first thing he asked is, why do you guys take your shoes off when you come in the house? You know, so I mean, so it, that's the kind of relationship we have. And I was like, you know, and so I explained to him, he said, no, it makes perfect sense. And, you know, so it, it, we have this kind of round robin relationship and where he can ask me things like that. And, and it's not offensive at all. It's just he wants to know, you know, so, um, and I look at him as, as a mentor and such a, a great, inspiration not just to myself but to all other coaches and people out there in that sense yeah I love that story about Andy and really a curiosity right about your Korean Korean American oh, heritage sure. um and so I, I think that's great did you teach him some Korean is it does he like Korean food now oh yeah absolutely I mean first chance I got I bought him I bought him the Korean staples and he was like this is absolutely amazing. So every road trip we went on, there was if there was a Korean restaurant, I made sure I beelined it there and brought them back some food. And yeah, absolutely. So I have one last question for you before we move on to Michelle. So growing up, your brothers played cello, they played the violin, they later became lawyers, and uh, you were into football. So were you treated like the black sheep of the family? You know, oh, I, I was, oh my goodness, I was for the, for the longest time. It was not so much an embarrassment, but like, who is this, who is this child in my household type thing, you know? It, uh, you know, they were all A students. They all graduated in National Honor Society, cum laude, not in cum laude. And, you know, there was me, you know, probably, you know, a, a B, B student. That's that's putting it, that's giving me myself a lot of accolades right there. Um, so my dad didn't understand sports. He was like, look, you're, you're you know, I was part of Your this. Your dad's an immigrant, right? Immigrant. Yeah, he immigrated here from Korea yeah, right, right after the Korean War. And, you know, he got his law degree from Yale. So, and, you know, he would tell me these stories of how he walked to school every day and, you know, you know, when he was a child, and I, you know, those, those stories, and it was uphill both ways, 20 miles, but, you know, when he actually took me back to Korea, we visited, he showed me his school, we were on the train from Solitego, I was like, oh, we're here now, and literally, probably 45 minutes later, the train comes to the train, I'm like, oh my gosh, he did walk to school, so that, that perspective right there, so I was supposed to be these, you know, not the typical, but the good Asian, you know, Korean son that, you know, follows in the father's footsteps, you know, now this is a piano player, you know, uh, so he didn't understand football one bit. And, uh, you know, as it started progressing through my high school career, when I first started playing, you know, when he realized that it could pay for college after having two, two older ones that he had to pay for, you know, their tuition and their law school, he was like, wait a minute, you mean it's 100% free? I was like, and the coaches were like, yeah, yes, Mr. Chung, it is. And he was like, this is the greatest sport on earth. You know, and I, all of a sudden it's embraced and he loves it now. And he's like, oh my gosh, I love football. Understood nothing about it, what the ball is about, who, what, what offense, defense. So, and then it has progressed through uh, when I was at Virginia Tech. And then he saw, he was like, wait a minute. Is, and I had to explain to him that you know, there's a professional level to this where they get paid to play this game. And he was like, this is absolutely amazing. He said, what a great country this is. What a great sport. So it was, I mean, it was a lot of fun. After, you know, after getting out of the uh, the, the shadows of my brother and, and kind of getting back in, into my own limelight, but then a completely different aspect of, of how I grew up and what I was, you know, not pressured to do, but was supposed to do as a, as a, a Korean American in this country. So then the bragging rights came, you know, it was, he had to wait a long time because, you, know, you know, my son, he went to UVA, he's a lawyer now. And then my son went to, you know, then there was Eugene. <laughs> kind of like, I think they kind of hid me underneath the staircase for a little while until, until then. No, but it was, it was great. And they embraced it. And it was, it was a lot of fun. And your dad was able to attend the press conference from the Patriots. Yeah. Yeah. Talk so that a was a big about surprise. That. Yeah. So and that was absolutely amazing. So it was, uh, they, you know, the Patriots call and they drafted me. And next thing you know, I'm on a, on a flight up to uh, up to Boston. I couldn't get a hold of my dad, which was, which was strange. You know, we didn't have cell phones back then. My goodness, and, you know. So we we land in uh, in Boston, and and uh, the person picking me up. So we had one person to pick up. I was like, okay. So we come pulling up, and there's my dad sitting there on the curb, just looking around. And you know, he comes out, and he gives me the <laughs> he gives me the biggest hug, and. Uh, mm-hmm absolutely amazing time and uh yeah. you know it was funny so when we got to the press conference he became like he kind of stole the show because then they brought him up and they asked him questions i was like wait a minute. <laughs> this, this is supposed to be my press conference but he kind of like stole the show but which was fantastic and uh that was a, a great experience for me well thank you Gigi, eugene for sharing those memories with us we are going to see you in uh, a few you know maybe sure. 
20 minutes or so, but we're going to say goodbye to you and we're going to say hello to Michelle. So if Michelle could turn on her camera, that would be great. Oh, there you are, Michelle. Hello. So Michelle, hello. You're joining us from Chicago. And um, Michelle is a studio anchor and national reporter uh, for ESPN. Uh, she files reports for Sports Center, Sunday NFL Countdown, and Outside the Lines. She is one of the few Asian American women journalists covering sports. So, um, Thank you, Michelle, for joining us today. You also used to be in the ESPN Boston Bureau too, right? Yeah, shout out Jamaica Plain, my old neighborhood. Shout out the Green Line T. Um, shout it still out works. Commonwealth <laughs> Avenue. Okay, <laughs> great. Happy to hear it. Public transportation, thumbs up. That's right. Um, so, so Michelle, um, you wanted to talk to us about being biracial and that experience, and you want to talk about how people in the world see you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, being uh, mixed race is definitely a, a growing demographic for sure in this country. And it's had a really interesting narrative as well, right? I mean, beyond race, of course, there are many ways that we're all different and we're all unique from each other. That's why the fish out of water story is so universal. But as someone who is mixed race and has been so my whole life, <laughs> I've had to navigate and really define surely who I am on a daily basis and from a super young age. And it's been a real journey for me to self-acceptance you know, along that trajectory. Uh, Here's an example. My mom wakes up and she sees a Filipino in the mirror and the world sees a Filipino, Filipina American lady. I wake up, I, I see, you know, both of my parents reflected in me, my mom who's Filipino and my dad who's white. And the world sees me and says, you're Mexican or you look Mexican. You know, I've, I've made le learning Spanish actually, at least passable Spanish a priority because I've been mistaken for Latino so much. So all that to say that so much of my life has been dealing with and grappling with how I perceive myself with how others tell me how they see me, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. You know, some of my earliest memories in school are kids asking me, what are you? And for the longest time, I would say I'm half Filipino and I would just leave the rest of it unsaid which is just a strange way to describe yourself is like as half of something, perpetually half of something. Sometimes like I can tell if someone is genuinely interested. I love Eugene's story about Andy Reid being, you know, sincerely and from everything I've heard about Andy Reid, like that checks out, sincerely curious, sincerely interested in making a connection with people who are different. And then there's other people who just kind of cannot go on with their day unless they put you in some kind of racial box. And that happened to my sister and I, we were on a family vacation in high school. We went to Alaska and we went to a gift store and the woman like would not let us leave the gift store without telling her what we were. And we told her, you know, we're half Filipino, half white. And she said, oh, you're, so you're half breeds, half breeds, which is like, Ugh. yeah, there's no word there's for it. And the worst part, one of the bad parts of this is that Shirley, she was actually Filipino. Mm. She was an older Filipino. And it's just such a reminder to me when we hear something like that in our own communities, mm -hmm. we need to call it out, whether it's racism, colorism. Um, the irony, of course, is that most Filipinos are a mix of other cultures. They're Malay, they're Chinese, they're Spanish. They're a mix. Mestiza is a word in the Philippines. So. Um, for me, it's definitely been a trajectory. I've gone from half Filipino to, okay, I'm just going to be American. And I had an experience living and working in another, another country in France where they thought I was adopted when I told them I was American because they have this idea of like blue eyes and blonde hair. And that's when I thought, you know what? I am Asian American. I'm honoring both sides of my culture. I essentially grew up, you know, with my Filipino relatives and I want to prove to other people, America is a multicultural, successfully, hopefully getting there, multicultural, heterogeneous place. So I describe myself as Asian American. That's where I, I am now. Yeah, I love that story of, of your, uh, of how, I'm sure that, you know, a lot of parents, you know, who have kids mixed race, I mean, this is just a great way to, to kind of frame your, the experience, what they may be dealing with as, 
uh, growing up. So I, I wanted to switch gears and talk to you about being a journalist and covering sports. Um, do you see a double standard in the way the media covers Asian American or Asian athletes? I would say, I mean, speaking broadly, you know, and I'm going to zoom out quite a bit here. Every moment of every day, your brain is telling itself stories. And the story that your brain tells is the one that takes the least amount of brain cells to tell. In other words, our brain fills in the blanks when we don't see the whole story. And that's very easily proved. If we're reading a sentence and let's say there's a word missing or a word that's missing a letter, we understand what the word is even though it's missing a letter. A computer would not see that word. So our brain fills in the blanks. And when Jeremy Lin debuted, and shout out Jeremy Lin, a pioneer, he just retired this week, there was a real fascination with Harvard. And the basketball part of it was almost secondary. You know, when, when many people think about Asian Americans in this country, they might think about math or science or SAT scores. And you saw that reflected in the coverage of him. In fact, AAJA, the Asian American Journalist Association, Association, put on a really lengthy cheat sheet at the time um, for people to stay away from references to the color yellow, you know, and his looks, because that's where people's minds naturally went. They weren't doing that necessarily because they wanted to prevent, I mean, obviously they wanted to prevent it, but because they had already been reacting to the coverage that they had seen. So, and more broadly here, the world that we live in, all of us live in social media, the algorithms parrot our thinking back to us. You know, mm -hmm. this person believes what I believe too. Oh my gosh. And it's in my Facebook feed. And the first step for everybody here, not even just Asian Americans, but everybody here, you know, if they want to be an ally, if you want to live in a more empathetic world, subscribe to a newspaper. Um, I know this is sponsored by the Globe. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. But, That's a good. <laughs> no, but subscribe to something that is not an unmoderated comment section that we're all marinating in for several hours a day. Get outside your own experience. Um, pay your cable bill too, so I stay gainfully employed. <laughs> but like, read a newspaper. Read something that is not your own algorithm of self curated stuff. Sorry for the long answer. It, no, that's great. So I got one last question before we move on to Alex. So, you know, you, you're an anomaly in, in um, the world of sports journalism, not only Asian American, but also a woman um, and, in a male dominated industry. So I was wondering if you could talk about some of the daily microaggressions um, that you probably deal with from sources and others. And, and if you could share us a, 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 just a bit of it and, and tell us how you handle those situations. Yeah, first of all, I, I do want to credit ESPN for hiring from as wide a talent pool as possible to make, you know, smart, creative stuff. Um, I grew up Filipino in a Filipino culture, you know, around my cousins, my grandparents, you know, obviously my mom Filipino. It's a culture of saving face. It's a culture of no conflict, no confrontation, respecting your elders. I'm not entirely like that anymore. Um, I feel like Asians are often told to be quiet, to kind of stay under the radar and not make noise. And I stand up for myself. I handle bullies when I need to. Really quick example, I was in a team facility. This is a few years ago. I was in a team facility. A guy comes up to me in the media room and says, you know, who do you work for? I say ESPN. He says, doing what? And I said, reporter. We're in the media room. He's, he's another member of the media. He didn't work for the team. And he's like, I don't, you know, you don't look like a reporter. You know, I, I don't get that vibe off of you. I wonder why that is. And I said, Maybe it's because you don't have a brain. You have no brains. <laughs> Maybe you left good, your brain at home. You know? <laughs> I just feel like you need to handle bullies because they won't know otherwise good that they're wrong. You. If need be, you know, I mean, don't be physically violent about it. But sometimes you do need to tell people to step all the way off because I don't have time. I don't have time. And uh, years later, I'm still a news fan. I'm still reporting. Uh, and this is what a sports reporter looks like. Thank you. Well, Michelle, thank you for um, sharing some stories with us. Um, we are going to um, see you later, actually in about 10 minutes. And we're going to say um, hi to Alex Shibutani. Um, he's joining us from California. Hi, Alex. 
<laughs> Hello, thank you for having me. Thanks for holding the space. Yeah, so Alex and his sister Maya, uh, also uh, AKA the Shib Sibs, hard to say, by the way. <laughs> you need a new nickname. Shib Sibs are hard to say. Anyways, they're two time Olympic bronze medalists in ice dance, and they represent a lot of firsts. Uh, the first dance team of Asian descent to win a medal at the Olympic Games, the first non Caucasian ice dance team to win a medal at the Olympic Games, the first ice dance team of Asian descent to win a U.S. title in ice dance. So um, Alex, it's so great to see you again. Um, I want to start off with um, some of your experience at the Olympics. Um, some of us still remember the infamous MSNBC um, headline, American Beats Kwan, you know, when Tara Lipinski edged out another fellow American, Michelle Kwan, for a, a gold medal in figure skating. And I was just wondering, has that happened to you in the Olympics where you're representing the U.S. and you've seen, you're seen as the perpetual foreigner, not, you're not actually American? <laughs> Um, yeah, no, uh, that's a good question. I guess probably to start things off for a little bit of context on myself, uh, you know, very excited to be here uh, at this event because I was born in Boston. I grew up in Connecticut and I've lived all over the country uh, and I'm, I guess, Japanese American, uh, Sante, which means I'm third generation. Uh, and so my Boston roots, uh, I was born at the Brigham and Women's uh, and I lived on campus at Harvard as a baby. Uh, and so, you know, I think you mentioned all of the firsts that my sister Maya and I have achieved uh, during our career. And I guess to start with, we are unavoidably unique in our sport. Uh, you know, for one, we're siblings in ice dance, a discipline of figure skating that has heavy creative reliance on romantic and dramatic themes. And we're Asian in ice dance, where only Caucasian teams have stood on the podium since the sport's inception uh, at the World Championships, I think in 1952 and the Olympic Games in 1976. Uh, and obviously we broke that trend in 2018 with two Olympic medals. Uh, and so, you know, basically to make a comparison to fantasy sports, uh, if anyone plays fantasy sports uh, on, this, on this call, if you were drafting an ice dance team and wanted to win medals uh, or win your, your league, uh, as the analogy goes, um, and you were following historical precedent and statistics, you wouldn't, pick us. You wouldn't put us together based on those two, like, uh, those two factors, those two characteristics that, just, you know, are us. Uh, and so, you know, we've had to be better and stronger, smarter, more creative and consistent than our competitors every step of the way in order to overcome the preconceived notions of judging panels, audiences around the world in a very subjective sport that obviously combines, like, you know, physical athleticism, but then also that artistic side uh, that people really appreciate. Um, and obviously, this is all also ingrained through, you know, our exposure to mainstream Western culture. Uh, and, and so that's, you know, some of the obstacles that we've had to overcome. And I think as far as the way that we're covered and perceived, I think partly because Maya and I are known as the ship sibs, uh, a large part of our image and the narrative that the media tends to use with us is our sibling relationship and our, our caring family dynamic, as opposed to pointing out or even acknowledging that we are minorities or Japanese Americans or Asian Americans or the only uh, team of color to ever medal at these major competitions. And so, of course, not acknowledging the role of race in our experience uh, in a subjectively judged sport is a disservice to us, um, whether it's conscious or unconscious, because it does downplay the bias that we we experience and we face. Uh, and so, like, as far as competing at the Olympic Games, it's it's an honor and a privilege. I'm so proud of representing Team USA, but for being a minority in the US, not being white means, like you mentioned, having your status as an American questioned uh, and being on the receiving end, I think Michelle mentioned it, like of microaggressions, you know, no, but where are you really from? Or what are you, uh, you know? And that's because it's assumed by a certain group of people that you can't possibly be from the United States if you aren't Caucasian. Uh, and so, yeah, there are comments on social media and there are occasionally uh, lazily reported uh, articles that go out there during the Olympics and other competitions. Um, but I think that by and large, our experience has been largely positive. We, we don't give a lot of energy or space to you know, ignorance uh, because we understand that it comes from, from a place of ignorance. Uh, and 
you know, <laughs> we, we get equal amounts probably of negative energy from people talking about our race and how we look, uh, but also people who think it's weird that siblings are skating together. And these are people who don't really know anything. They don't know us. They've never seen us skate. Uh, they're just kind of commenting very knee-jerk reactions on social media. And you'd be surprised to know that like uh, many of these people are journalists, mm -hmm. um, you know, people making these comments. And I would be lying if I didn't keep a tab on who they are and what outlets they work for, uh, you know. It, Send the it, list to Michelle nobody. and me. We'll take care of it for you. <laughs> it's okay. No, I mean, I, it's, I don't want to be like, you know, uh, <laughs> aggressive in that way. I think just basically it's about, you know, speaking with our skating and our actions and, and winning and, and showing up in that way uh, and representing in that way. And I think that we've definitely had an impact both nationally and especially internationally as far as widening the scope of what people understand being American is and can be. Mm -hmm. So in addition to your ice stand, I stance first with your sister. You were also the first Asian American man to become a US national champion in, or, or I should say Asian American man in, in figure skating, right? To right. become a national, a US national champion. So who have been your role models in sports? Yeah, so, I mean, you know, I could say some kind of for this call, boring figure skating examples that, you know, people will be like, oh yeah, that makes sense. But uh, because this is the globe and because I'm from Boston and I'm a big sports fan, I guess I can give some Boston specific examples. Uh, as a kid, when I first started ice dancing with Maya, I have distinct memories of listening to game seven of the 2003 ALCS with my ear like inches from the stereo in my room with the volume super low because I was supposed to be sleeping because uh, I had training the next morning. And I just remember, uh, you know, that Aaron Boone home run and punching my pillow and like quietly weeping myself to sleep. And the next morning was pretty rough. So like sports have been a huge part of my life. Uh, and the following year when I was 12, uh, we happened to be competing at one of our first big competitions together in our ice dance career. And it coincided with the 2004 ALCS, which we all know they started out down 03 and that comeback kind of coincided with the lifting of my mood and some of the best skating that I had done to that point. Uh, so yeah, I've taken inspiration from a lot of different places, even though I was the first Asian American man to win a US title in figure skating, you know, uh, I, the idiots, that team resonated with me because they were cool, they had fun, uh, and they were defiant of like precedent, 86 years of just bad luck, bad news, negative history. Uh, no one necessarily expected anything of them, even though expectations were always so high and they, they overcame. And then, you know, there are other examples, like I'll make a hockey example. Uh, in 2013, I want to say, Gregory Campbell, uh, playing for the Bruins at that time, took a slap shot off of his leg and the impact of the puck broke his leg and he was on the power play. And I remember watching that game and he stayed on the ice and he's like hobbled. He's... Uh, you know, just trying to stay on his feet and be there for his teammates. And that was inspirational. And David Ortiz's leadership following the Boston Marathon bombings and just the figure that he's had in the city. Uh, those are all things that resonate. And I think things that also already exist within myself, but, you know, sports serves as a wonderful reminder for all of us when we see something inspirational uh, mm -hmm. that can kind of allow us to refocus on those qualities and, and implementing them in our own lives. So uh, one last question for me, and we'll bring everybody back. So um, with the rise in anti-Asian hate incidents in the US, um, I mean, you've been asked to speak on panels like this and um, and, and do various interviews, I'm sure, with, with the media. So how, how are you processing this new role? I mean, it, does this feel like a new role for you? Yeah, um, I guess. I've been in the spotlight for such a long time, since we were kids, really. Um, and so, you know, from the age of 12, uh, obviously that platform has grown uh, as we've experienced more and, and accomplished more things. But with my platform and visibility, I'm used to speaking out on various issues and supporting different initiatives and causes that I care about. Uh, and I think I've been vocal about a lot of things for a while now. Probably the biggest difference now, though, is I think that people are seeing things and perhaps me in a different way, uh, and I'm being asked more questions about race, uh, and we're beginning to see more people listening to Asian American 
and Pacific Islander voices and experiences, which, which is great. And you know, while I do have this platform, and yes, I am an Asian American person, I'm not an expert on all things AAPI. Uh, the AAPI community is not a monolith. It's so diverse. Uh, there's so many you know, beautiful elements to it. And so I've been focused on raising awareness and speaking truth to power and amplifying the voices of experts who've been working in the space for years and years. And I think, I guess I take issue because everyone has a different experience and journey. Um, but I've seen sort of a generalization made that Asians are only now finally speaking up about social issues like racism and discrimination. And I disagree with that in that Asian Americans have this incredibly long and rich history of speaking out against injustices. Uh, and a narrative that claims otherwise is erasure. It's, it's erasing years of hardship and work that has gone into uplifting not only our own communities, but fighting for the rights of others in this country as well. And so, you know, Maya and I as a team have always cared about supporting and uplifting marginalized communities through sports, through entertainment and education. Uh, we've served as sports envoys for the US State Department with their sports diplomacy program where we go to foreign countries and have the opportunity to share our experiences and, and exchange information and ideas with young people around the world. Uh, and you know, we support underrepresented filmmakers even. Uh, that's kind of like a pivot from sports because we understand the importance of visibility and representation in storytelling, like Michelle was mentioning. We fill in the gaps in the stories uh, without really taking the time to better understand the perspectives of people uh, and how they impact the way we see the world. Uh, and you know, again, I'm in a unique situation. I'm in a team sport with one other person and that other person happens to be my family member, my sister, uh, and she's a woman. And so I've always been supportive of equity and women's empowerment in sport and in business because I'm an equal partner on a team with my sister. So through my exposure and just who I am uh, as a person, I think that um, I've been able to you know, speak up for things uh, over time and I hope to continue to do more to represent uh, and you know, uh, not speak for, but amplify voices within both the AAPI community and others. Thank you, Alex, for saying that, because um, there have been Asian Americans who have been outspoken about racism. And but frankly, the media, we might not cover it as much. Right. But I'm, I'm hoping sure. that will change. I'm hoping that the voices have been there. Um, they just haven't been um, heard and, and listened to. So hopefully that will change uh, starting this year. So I'm going to bring back Eugene and Michelle. We have a few more questions. All um, these are all submitted, pre-submitted from the audience. Um, uh, but if you have live questions, again, use your Q and A function. Um, please, um, you know, toss in some questions. Uh, I want to start out with a question about um, Asian Americans in sports. Um, this is for everyone to answer. Um, what is the most important thing that needs to change for Asian Americans to have more opportunities um, and visibility in U.S. youth? collegiate and professional sports. Um, Eugene, you want to start us off on that? Uh, yeah, I think just understanding what, what athletics are, what sports are, what that brings to uh, a child, uh, to a young person growing up in this in this society. It's to work as a team member to experience, you know, uh, success and failure at the same time. It's huge. I think, I think for me, it's the understanding of, of what athletics brings to a child's life uh just the learning lessons that they that they can learn at a young age and that can carry through their whole life um as as it moves forward from there i, I think just having the opportunity uh, and the more and more um i'm on social media now i'm seeing more and more kids getting recruited that are of asian uh heritage and pacific honor heritage so uh, i'm it, it's starting to happen because I think that information is getting out there and what it can provide and the and the lifelong uh, lessons that can be learned from it. I think that's part of uh, of it growing in, and organically growing is just the parents understanding what sports actually is. I think that's a huge part of, of it growing in this country. Anyone else want to take up that, that question, uh, Alex or Michelle? <laughs> No, I think Eugene answered it so 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 gracefully. Um, it's it's opportunity, but it's representation, representation, representation at all levels of sport, 
uh, and in adjacent industries as well. And inclusivity in the media plays a big role in that because that's how we read and watch sports. That's how it's delivered to us. Uh, and so real thoughtfulness when it comes to covering these stories and we all have to examine our personal biases uh, and no matter what they might be. I think one sort of thing that has been in, on my mind recently has been, uh, you know, Shohei Otani in the major leagues. Uh, what he's doing right now is absolutely incredible. Uh, you know, leading the league in home runs and, you know, throwing over a hundred miles per hour. And I've seen a bunch of people tweet, like I think JJ Watt tweeted the other day about their awe of what he's doing and, you know, sort of their confusion as to why more people aren't talking about them because he really should be the story in baseball right now. Uh, and they wonder why he isn't getting more buzz. And I think it's important to take a hard look at that not only as an anecdote, but wonder why. Is it perhaps because he's Asian? Um, there might be some truth to that. So, you know, representation is what we all deserve. And it's important that we, you know, celebrate the accomplishments of athletes in this country, past and present, so that we can inspire, uh, you know, participation for athletes and aspiring athletes in the future. I think giving Asian Americans more opportunities and visibility will only make sports better for everyone. And I think that goes for any ethnic group. Michelle, as a member of the sports <laughs> journalism um, uh, world, I mean, is this, do those kind of discussions happen at ESPN on how, you know, why, uh, you know, why certain athletes get covered more than others? And, and if, if do you look at through a, a you know, a, a lens of race from time to time? Yeah, I'm sure those conversations are happening. They're a little bit above my pay grade. But when it comes to stories that I pitch that involve um, athletes of color, that involve um, covering athletes that bring a unique and different, quote unquote, background to the table, the editors that I have pitched to, the producers that I have spoken with, everybody has always been open to those kinds of stories. You know, last year, rather, I actually delete 2020 from my mind. I'm talking about 2019 now. In 2019, I did a story on Tim Anderson, who's a shortstop for the Chicago White Sox, and he doesn't play by the unwritten rules by baseball. He does things his own way, and part of that is embracing his Black culture. I pitched that to ESPN. They ran with it, and it ended up, and you know, I guess speaking candidly, not everybody necessarily was on board and was like, hey, let's 100% do this. But there were people in the building that advocated for it, that realized this is a story that's important that we need to do. And we ended up producing and executing on that story. Tim loved it. I think it was it, it did really well sort of nationally and among a baseball audience. But yeah, those conversations are definitely having. They, they realize that there is an importance in covering all athletes, but also in a multidimensional way, you know? We should be telling the stories of athletes because we're ESPN, but not just celebrating their achievements, but 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 the whole telling their whole story, their whole human story. And for me, that that that's been incredibly satisfying. Well, we have another question about, um, you know, how how have you built alliances professionally and or personally with other people of color in your field? or uh, Michelle, in your case, other women in your field. Um, have you found it challenging to do so? Um, if so, have you worked to over, how, do, how, have you over, have you, how have you worked to overcome those challenges? Well, I can take this first just because um, I was not always involved with AAJA over my career at ESPN. I have to shout out one of my great and intelligent coworkers, Howard Chen, who just, you know, talk my ear off. I'm, I'm kind of, there's a little bit of hyperbole there, but in a nice way, you know, really, really encouraged me to join and convinced me that, you know, I, I'm not an Im imposter when I'm around AJA where I felt like, okay, maybe I'm not Asian enough or something, um, but it's been wonderful. It's so important to have a network outside your own personal, you know, work network. Uh, I felt like I had something to offer. So many of the issues that AAJ talks about speak to me as well. And then you also have to build alliances. You know, AAJ wouldn't be where it is, at least a sports task force, without NABJ and NAHJ. I'm not going to go into all the acronyms because I know we're running short on time. Well, it, those are the but, journalists, Asian American Journalists Association. Yes, Black National Journalists Association, yes, and Hispanic Journalists Association. So 
you know, a rising tide lifts all boats. And we also need to acknowledge that so much work has been done before us. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, create those alliances. Eugene, there's a follow-up question for you um, on this very similar topic. Is this, do you do you receive support from black players and players of other races or, or black coaches and, and other and, and coaches of other races? Sure, sure. I, I, I do. Um, you know, in the league uh, alone, one of my other uh, good friends, uh, Juan Castillo, who's with the Chicago Bears, who's a um, Mexican descent. So I mean, we, we support each other when it comes to that, but we know each other's struggles and what we've had to go through. We've told each other our stories and we were always trying to outdo each other, but, uh, and we, and we support each other when it comes to that and the understanding of what we have to do and, and the work that we have to put in has always been at the forefront of our conversations. Um, and the other, uh, African-American coaches and Hispanic coaches that are in the league, Ron Rivera is another, uh, advocate of mine and an and ally and he understands the struggles too so um so when whenever we do have conversations we always know what we're talking about and and the and the climate of the conversation and where it needs to go and, and the answers that need to be uh, uh the questions that need, need to be answered so yeah i do find support um and there's ridicule also on the other on the other end too so um, I mean, there's been plenty of times where you find out real quick who your allies are and who aren't your allies when it comes to that. Um, you know, out, outside of football, there's the, the Asian community has always been, you know, a big help, but the Asian sports community is is relatively small, <laughs> um, and, and especially in the, in the cities that I've, I've coached in. But uh, teams from uh, Seoul, Korea have reached out. Uh, the the X League in Japan has reached out also. So there, I mean, there's, there's support. It's, it's just, it's now getting legs and starting to grow. Mm-hmm, great. So we have about nine minutes left. <laughs> I want to try to get through maybe one and a half questions. So, so fast, uh, fast answers are, would be appreciated. So um, uh, has the rash of anti-Asian attacks, both verbal and physical impacted your approach to your sport and or life? And how can we use sport to bridge differences? Um, who wants to take that first? <laughs> well, I, I know if in my experience, you know, the football, American football, has always been kind of like the glue that brings everybody together. You know, at the, at, at the start of every Sunday or Saturday, everything's put down. It doesn't matter what color, what race. When that game comes on, they all come together as, as one group, you know, whoever you're rooting for. And you always see those barriers get dropped down for that short amount of time. Um, so that, that, I always see that as uh, how sports can be like a, a, a bond or a bridge between different cultures and different races, you know, wherever it is. I mean, Philadelphia is one of the biggest melting pots I see that I've had experience with in the cities I've coached in. And on those Sundays, you just see all different uh, diverse backgrounds coming together and to have fun and, and enjoy, you know, that day. So, uh, you know, in my experience with that, it's, uh, it's, you know, I, I see how sports can bring uh, nations together and bring races together and bring, you know, just different cultures together to, to, to have camaraderie amongst each other. Mm-hmm. Great. Um, I, I was going to say something because um, on the, on the issue of like, how has it changed your approach to life? You know, there have been definitely different feelings. Um, and by that, I mean, feelings that I have not experienced before until this year. Um, and seeing the anti-Asian hate and the violence um, that appears to be worsening, you know, over the last year or so. I was in Indianapolis for March Madness and I was walking, my mom was with me and I was walking with my mom and we passed by an Asian woman with her son. And then there was another, a non-Asian man walking towards all of us. And I got scared, you know, I got worried that something bad would happen. And it was such a bad, it was such a bad feeling to have. And it's a new feeling um, Mm -hmm. that I've experienced, um, you know, in recent months, I'm way more worried about my mom than I used to be if she's like, if she's out walking or exercising or what have you, she she's vaccinated, but she still wears a mask outside. And I think old Michelle would be like, ah, oh, mom, you don't have to wear a mask outside the CDC, blah, blah, blah. 
I'm okay with her wearing a mask. I'm okay. I'm concerned about all my older relatives, you know, um, coming across, you, you see those videos and it's so disturbing. And I've had to really practice no small amount of like self-care when it comes to consuming that those stories. And when it comes to consuming those videos, I think there's a real danger sometimes, you know, you'll, you'll be at like TGI Fridays, and you'll see those images on just blasted, you know, on cable news 24 hours a day. And I'm, I'm, there's a, there's a concern, I think, yes, we need to be aware, but there's a concern that we're becoming inured mm -hmm. to those images. And we should never become desensitized to those images. It's so shocking. It's so harrowing. We all need to reject it. Um, and it's, and it's something that I'm processing right now. So yeah, it's definitely affected my life. I've, I've, I've had to have concerns and anxieties that I did not have before. Mm -hmm. Michelle, I hear that so often that, um, you know, Asian elderly a Asians to keep their masks on so they can basically hide their Asian-ness, right? Um, Alex, do you have anything else to add? I mean, yeah, it's, it's also tragic, uh, the scapegoating, the unprovoked attacks towards members of the AAPI community especially you know, in a year after we've experienced a global pandemic uh, that has disproportionately impacted um, communities of color. Uh, you know, it's just, it's awful. Uh, and so you know, these attacks that we're seeing on the news uh, and the ones that we aren't seeing because there are many that go underreported or unreported uh, and you know, ignored. Uh, these attacks, these victims could be anyone that you see on camera right now on this on this Zoom. Uh, you know, the reality is that when I'm on the ice competing or I have my Team USA gear on, uh, that is privilege that protects me in certain environments. But when I'm off the ice and I'm on the street and I'm wearing street clothes, uh, you know, it's a difficult thing to sit with, realizing that we're in a climate that is so, uh, you know, intolerant and uh, it doesn't, it doesn't make sense. Um, and it, it's a sad time. I'm concerned about kids going back to school in the fall, uh, and, and the bullying that they're going to have to experience. That being said, like I mentioned earlier, the Asian American community is resilient. Uh, we have a long history and education is, is a part of that. More people need to know about Asian American history. I took AP US history. There's European history in our schools. No one learns anything other than the paragraph and a half about the Chinese Exclusion Act or Japanese American, you know, internment, uh, and it gets glossed over. And so there's this re-education process that we're all going through in this country, um, in addition to the obvious safety concerns. Yeah, a hundred percent, Alex. Like I'm so glad that you mentioned history because we don't know our own history, and that I'm talking about. American society writ large, not just the Asian American community. And we need to know right. our own history too. Yes. You know, we need to make sure that we're not reproducing the discrimination of the exclusionary acts by some of the language that we've been hearing over the last year as it relates to the virus. We need to make sure that we, we're, we're all in this together, you know, and that we understand the history and that we're not repeating it. And that's where I think like sport plays such an important role. And, and, you know, I don't want to sound like I'm on a soapbox, but it's like finding a way, whatever your age, to express yourself in this time through sport or art or any form of creativity where you can be seen by the world and you can find your community. We live in an era where it's more possible. There, there are the, the malignant truths of the internet, but it is also a place where we can become connected to each other in ways that we've never been able to be connected before. And so, you know, obviously while maintaining a degree of, of mental health and sanity, uh, it's just important to experience joy during these times mm. and celebrate uh, despite the hardships, despite the challenges and the violence that we're seeing on a daily basis. Well, Alex, Michelle, Eugene, thank you for sharing your experiences with us today. Um, I love that we are ending on a note about Asian American resilience and joy to also remember to celebrate that during this month. I'm gonna hand this back to um, Wale Ogunlia. Ogunlia? <laughs> Wale, I'm gonna be saying your name in my sleep tonight. <laughs> so good, hey. Listen, great conversation. And uh, I want to thank the audience 
for joining us today. We hope to continue uh, and share in a dialogue throughout the remainder of the series. So Cheryl, um, thank you for having this, this uh, conversation. We really appreciate that. But once again, I wanna thank Eugene, uh, Alex and Michelle for their candor in discussing the challenges they face. The, the pandemic has intensified many of these challenges which we've talked about uh, with hateful rhetoric and baseless claims igniting a surge in hostility that results in humiliation, fear, injury, and sometimes we've seen death. We aspire for a world where targeted communities can find safety and solace in those who can defend and support them. If you'd like to discuss any of the topics raised today, I will urge you to reach out to Shirley. Or if you have questions about your personal wealth, your businesses, and how your financial goals can be accomplished between the two, I encourage you to speak with the UBS financial advisor to access the insights, the knowledge, the resources from all UBS global wealth management to help you reimagine the power of investing. Or check out all of our resources we have for athletes and entertainers at ubs.com backslash legacy. Once again, I'd like to thank Shirley, the Boston Globe for putting on this program and launching this series. It was, it was amazing. I, I related with everything that you guys talked about. Please look out for the next program in the coming weeks. We are very looking forward to seeing you there virtually, of course. Be well and thank you.